No score in the first. Here's Rockford's lineup. Caleb Durbin back in the top spot. He's consistently been Rockford's leadoff man the last few games. Johnny Butler, Jake Vanderwall, and Matt Higgins in the meat of the order. Alex Steinbach follows. Kirk Liebert, Tom Jostin, and Corey Wright, a pitcher turned position player for today. We'll get to that later. And Anthony Fumagalli in the ninth spot. So we have a position player pitching and a pitcher playing a position. And that position player pitching is Seth Tucker, who's really a two-way guy, listed as a hitter, but plays two ways in college and here with the Northwoods League. Yeah, Mr. Tucker has appeared in two games. This is his first start. He's thrown three innings, so limited action on the bump for the Bombers so far this season. He's allowed one hit, one walk. He struck out one and hasn't allowed an earned run, so he's got an ERA of zero. Facing Caleb Durbin to start. Durbin batting 296 and a first pitch strike from Seth Tucker. We saw Seth Tucker yesterday as a hitter Went one for four with a run scored and also stole a base. He's played three games as a hitter and two as a pitcher. One ball, one strike. A sidearm guy. We see a lot of sidearm guys in the league, quite frankly. A few on Kalamazoo, namely the Jackrabbits as well. And so another three quarters drop down delivery. Rockford is pretty familiar with those at this point. We'll see how they react to Tucker today. Tucker has not gone more than two innings in either appearance. This is his first start. All three of his appearances have been away from Battle Creek. Most recently against Kalamazoo just three days ago. Two balls and two strikes on Durbin. Freshman from Wash U St. Louis. He's played seven games and he has hits in six of them. He's also walked in three straight. Tucker's 2-2, up high, ball three. These two teams combining for 17 runs and 21 hits yesterday. In a matchup of two pitchers, you got one in Hunter Keim, who has an ERA of more than eight, and Tucker, who has not started this season, as he walks Durbin. He could be in for another high-scoring show today. He certainly could be, and Rockford's offense Looked like it was off to a slow start yesterday, but finally got the wheels turning, but almost too little too late, falling just a run short in the ninth inning. But positive sign as the wheels were indeed turning and something that we haven't seen a whole lot of lately. This offense has been come and go all season, but looks like they're starting to find their stride as the season winds down, a little more consistency. and Maybe that has to do a little bit of Caleb Durbin in the top spot. He's done fantastic up there. Coming into today's game with a 406 on base percentage. Improves that there with that walk. Facing Johnny Butler, who has an on base percentage of 415. Butler drew a couple of walks yesterday, was one for three, batting 287 this season. Two home runs as well. Pops it out of play. Not often you see a guy with two home runs and five RBIs, but there's Johnny Butler. He has 22 runs scored and five RBIs, so you can imagine where in the batting order he usually is. Yeah, We've seen him in the top spot before Durbin came along, and I guess he just got bumped down one spot in the order. And he's a nice piece with Vanderwaal and Dak Higgins in the hole. That's a nice stretch of lineup for Josh Keim. Three guys that can really knock the ball around. Butler has scored a run in 12 of his last 15 games, including one yesterday. Two one. Just got a piece again. Two and two. Well, Traverse City has a three nothing lead after one inning against Kalamazoo. They shut out the Growlers yesterday. Rockford cannot take advantage and post a win of their own against the lowly Battle Creek Bombers. So the lead for Kalamazoo remains five games, and they own the tiebreaker with 11 games to play for Rockford. Two two. Runner takes off. A hit and run is popped up to left center field. Durbin's got to get back as Peterson measures it, hauls it in, and does not throw over. One man away. That brings up Jake Vanderwall, who had a hit and two stolen bases yesterday, but also a very costly caught stealing in the ninth inning 
on a run that really didn't matter with Rockford trailing by three. Tried to take third base on a pass ball that didn't even escape the batter's circle and was tagged out by a couple of feet at third base on a play that was not very heady. And if he wasn't tagged out at third base, he would have scored. Because, of course, three more runs would come around and score for Rockford in that inning. Lines one, past the bag for a base hit for Vanderwall. Toward the side wall it goes. German takes off for third. Vanderwall goes for second. And just like that, Vanderwall's got a double. Timely hitting. And Jake Vanderwall is pretty good at that. There's a reason he's in the three spot. And Rockford's offense has something going here early on in the first Black inning. You can't underestimate scoring first. Rockford needs this momentum after a tough loss last, last night. And we say it a lot, Rockford really needs this win tonight. It's been the mantra the last two weeks. 13th double for Jake Vanderwall, his 22nd extra base hit to lead the Rockford team. Two on base for the struggling Matt Higgins. 0 for his last 15. Again in the cleanup spot for Josh Keim. Sends the first pitch a long way. Should get the run home as Johnson comes over in the gap. Hauls it in and Durbin comes around. Vanderwall going for third and he's in there safely as well. A sack fly for Higgins makes it one nothing in the first. And when you're struggling, you just gotta focus on good contact and Higgins got under that one but it was good enough to score the run. Picks up an RBI in the second consecutive game for him. And a productive out. What more can you ask for? 30th RBI of the year for Higgins. He's got a run batted in in two straight games. That brings up Steinbach. Steinbach, the third baseman playing his second game, was one for three in yesterday's contest. Curveball for a strike. So Rockford has four guys in their lineup today with four or fewer at bats. Steinbach's got three. Kirk Liebert behind him has four. Corey Wright has none, and Anthony Fumagalli has four. One ball, one strike. So four of the last five guys in the lineup, Tom Joseph being the only exception in the number seven spot, have essentially played either zero games or one game for Josh Kine. Yeah, you could say that the lineup is inexperienced, but people forget these guys play baseball outside of the Northwoods League. A high pop for Johnson. In the sun, makes the catch, and that retires the side. But Rockford scores first, a Higgins sack fly. 1-0 screws after one. 1-0 one Rockford, bottom half of the second. Rivets with a run on a sack fly for Matt Higgins in the first inning. Seth Tucker out to face Kirk Lieber, Tom Joseph, and Corey right here in the second. Here's Battle Creek's defense. Trace Peterson, Colby Johnson, and Caleb Bailgard out there in the outfield. Anthony Catalano and Michael Morissette on the corners. Josh Sheck and Cooper Trinkle up the middle. Gabe Sotrace behind the dish tonight. So Rockford, the team that scores first today. Hunter Kyer for the first time in a start this season. No runs allowed in the first. And in fact, he's scoreless through two, just one hit. He's left two on base. Kirk Lieber to bat for Rockford, still in search of his first hit. 0 for 4 in yesterday's game, but he did score two runs and stole a base for Rockford. Lieber, the catcher from Wabash Valley College in Mount Carmel, Illinois. Native of Owensboro, Kentucky. Ball one to him. Batted 424 with his JUCO team with 22 RBIs in 40 games. Had an OPS of more than 1,100. Two balls and no strikes to him. He was 0 for 4 in his debut yesterday, but you've got to figure that he'll find his stroke here in Rockford with a batting average number that high. Man, the dude can swing the lumber. We'll see how he transitions from metal to wood here late in the season in the Northwoods League. I had 3 0. Liebert walked once yesterday. Tom Joseph on deck, who's arguably the hottest Rockford hitter in the seventh spot for Josh Kine. And a four pitch walk to Liebert. So he gets on base for the second time this season. And Joseph's got a man on. Yeah, Liebert's the catcher. So obviously he's gonna have a good eye at the plate. Showing off that plate vision there, you're not gonna get away with throwing too many balls outside of the zone to a backstop. 
And as you mentioned, Jostin in the seventh spot. I think that's a calculated move by Josh Keim. And Jostin has almost acted as a spark to the bottom half of the order. Yesterday it worked, and we saw production out of the bottom half. Anthony Fumagalli, who was down there yesterday, had a three RBI base knock in his only hit of the day. So pretty productive in the bottom half for Rockford yesterday, and Jostin back down there again today. A hard swing on the first pitch. It's been working well for Jostin recently. Six for his last 17 on the road trip and yesterday, batting 353 in that span. Been on base in 16 straight games. The only two-time player of the week. A crack on 0-1, just foul. That would have probably scored Kirk Liebert. 0-2 on Tom Jostin. Does strike out a lot, 50 times in 50 games this season. Two home runs on the road trip. He's got three this season. All three have come on the road. The party porch is once again occupied to begin the game today. 0-2, and Josen down on a breaking ball. First strikeout for Seth Tucker, and the dangerous Tom Josen goes down for the first down. That was a pretty nasty breaking pitch from Tucker, throwing it well in the dirt. He was out ahead of Josen. He knew he didn't have to throw him a strike, so he didn't, and Josen gave chase results in the first strikeout. That brings up Corey Wright. No, Rockford's not setting a pitcher out there. They still got their DH. Josen was, in fact, the DH. Corey Wright playing first base today. Batted 158 with Rockford as a hitter in 13 games last season. And a first pitch strike to him. I'd imagine with, without playing at Valdosta State this past season after transferring and only playing 13 games in summer ball a year ago, he's got to be a bit uneasy at the plate, perhaps, taking that first pitch. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how he reacts in his at-bats this evening. He looks comfortable, so at least he's pulling that off. You know, look good, play good, I guess that's half the battle. And he's rocking the stirrups as he always does, so he's got that going for him. What a quote, Dumbledore, you can never have enough socks. Interesting. Stirrups from Corey Wright. Never it's have it's enough stirrups. It's, it's Harry Potter night here at the ballpark. A ball and two strikes on Corey Wright. Pull that one out of the back of your head. As a big Harry Potter fan, yes. We're gonna stick to baseball. Here's the one, two. Two balls and two strikes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think wizarding is our expertise. We'll see if Rockford can pull some wizardry in the last 11 games of the season. It's certainly in the realm of possibility. They're not going to need any spells for that, but they're just going to need Kalamazoo to lose a lot of games. Runner takes off a hit and run is sent foul. There might, might have to be some, some magic involved for Rockford to make up six games in 11 days. Well, it would be quite the comeback. I mean, Maybe the miracle Rockford Rivets of 2019. Not quite a miracle, but we're getting there. 50 years after the miracle Mets, maybe? Who knows? Well, they've got the miracle Mets connection with Duffy Dyer. Well, that's kind of a reach In of a way. connection. Three balls, two strikes on Corey Wright. And there's strike three call. He's rung up. Back-to-back -back case for Seth Tucker. And right on the season is 0 for 1. Well, struck out 14 times last season. There's K number one. And it looks like Tucker settled in here. Showing off that nice slider, it looks like, from that three-quarter sidearm angle. And it's been sharp this evening. Again, the runner takes off at a hit, by, uh, hit and run. is sent foul by Fumagalli. Kirk Liebert, who had a base steal yesterday, has attempted to go twice and has had to make the trot back both times. Fumagalli won for four yesterday, but had a three RBI hit. Oh, two RBI hit and a sack fly yesterday. So three total RBIs in his first game as a rivet, the sophomore from Purdue Northwest. Oh, one. One ball, one strike. Fumagalli from Plainfield, Illinois. One of a couple of guys we've seen this season from Plainfield. One of two on this Rockford team. With DuPage College this past season, then Central College a year ago, same school as Adam Carey. 
Again, a steal, no hit and run, and safe at second base, Kirk Liebert. Two balls and a strike on Fumagalli, and Kirk Liebert is two for two. How about that? Liebert's getting his sprints in early on today. I bet he, he might be a little out of gas on second base after sprinting down there twice to no avail and finally swipes that back there. Two and two on Fumagalli just off the corner. I mean, we've, we've seen speed at the catcher's spot for Rockford. Nick Jouer was pretty fast. But other than that, it's, it's been a few bigger guys for Rockford. And that's Liebert picking up where Jouer left off. 2-2. Two -two. Fumagalli pops it up. Cooper Trinkle, his counterpart at second base, ends the inning there. So Rockford strands one. one nothing screws after two. Here in the third, a 1-0 Rockford lead. How about Hunter Kime scoreless through three? He's looked really, really sharp. He's painting the corners well. I mean, his, his control struggles have been there. Two walks, but he's worked around back-to-back -back leadoff walks, and that's what it's all about at the end of the day. It looks the same in the scorebook as long as you throw up zeros. And as we discussed before the game, it was all about the start for him. He struggled in the first inning and in his last few starts, and struggled in the early innings and avoiding the big inning is key for Rockford and Kimes done a nice job thus far. Seth Tucker on the other hand has allowed just one run on one hit. A Matt Higgins sack fly in the first facing Caleb Durbin top of the order and he falls rather it's a ball high for a 1-1 count. Durbin walked back in the first on a 3-2 pitch. Two balls and a strike. And now Tucker falls behind. There it is. Well, Tucker has also looked pretty sharp. Without that sack fly by Matt Higgins, we'd have a 0-0 ball game. And Tucker has done a really nice job of avoiding hard contact without, you know, with the exception of that Vanderwall double. And Tucker's also had the strikeout stuff working. Back-to-back -back strikeouts in the second. He'll look to continue that here in the third. So Durbin walked in the first. 3-1 count. Swings away and fouls it off. 3-2. How about those hands on deck by Johnny Butler to snag that one very casually with the batting glove on his hand. And foul balls to the on deck circle might scare some guys, but not Johnny Butler. They scare you? No, I, I didn't get many when I was in high school. No, they don't scare me. Hard grounder, snagged at third, Catalano's throw over is high. And that ball was flipped back and it hit Durbin in the back of the head. The catcher, Sotra's coming over to try to cover or at least back it up. And Morris had at first base after retrieving the ball, tried to flip it to him and he hit the back of the head of Caleb Durbin, who's safe at first. That's not something you see every day. And of course, I'll pull out the classic line. You see something new at the ballpark every day. And I guess that makes the list. Morissette flipping to his invisible other defender covering the bag. And I guess he thought that maybe Tucker was going to be there or even so trace, but it doesn't really matter because he tossed it pretty lightly. So just a, a slight blooper. It'll leave a bruise for sure. Strike one to Johnny Butler. Fly to left his last time. He's 0 for 1. So Durbin on base for the second straight time. A nice snag it was by Catalano, but couldn't make the throw over. I was just about to say, you know, that's a tough play to make, but the hardest part is getting up and making the throw in time. It is part of the reason, and I was reading something today about you know, how some of the better position players, on the left side of the infield especially, get charged for more errors because they get to balls better but sometimes have trouble throwing over, but otherwise it'd be a base hit had they not picked it up. Exactly, so on paper in the scorebook, they might be the quote unquote worst defender than their counterparts at first base and second base. But as you mentioned, short stops are usually quicker and third basemen are, are really good with the, I don't know, fast twitch muscles down at the hot corner. And we saw it there on Catalano, making the nice stop, maybe preventing extra bases. And that's something that's just not in the scorecard. 
Exactly. And Catalano gets charged for the error when that could be a ball dribbling to the bullpen. And Durbin could easily be at second. Yeah, certainly an intangible thing that you don't really understand unless you're watching the game. Runner takes off, hit and run, is blooped in the center for a base hit. First and second, nobody out to begin the third. Hot start for Rockford here in their half of the third. You gotta love that. Early production from Hunter Keim on the mound. And Rockford went out there and got him the lead in the bottom half of the first. And they can only make things easier if they can pick up another run or two here. Once again, a man on base for Jake Vanderwall. In fact, two of them doubled back in the first. That moved Caleb Durbin over to third, and he eventually scored. So Vanderwall's one for one, has 23 extra base hits this season. At the 22, 13 doubles. Shot to the opposite field. Peterson gives it a look. One away. And Durbin does not move up. Not deep enough off the bat of Vanderwall. There's one away. Yeah, Vandy was really frustrated. You could see it right off the bat. He's pretty disappointed. Kind of tossed his bat down. And for good reason. You always want to come through, especially when you're the three hitter, when you've got a runner in scoring position. Came through back in the first, not to be here in the third. Now Matt Higgins. Top button is undone. Chains in full view. Had a sack fly back in the first. 30 RBIs this season for Higgins. Takes ball one, that ball gets away from Sotris and both runners move up. A wild pitch thrown from Tucker. So both runners advance and the double play is out of commission. Wouldn't this be a great time for Higgins to break out of his slump? All it takes is one and even a lightly hit ball that sneaks through the infield or gets blooped over the infield's head would score two runs and he's got an RBI yesterday, already has an RBI today. That might give him some confidence. Grounder to second, that snag from Trinkle, run does come home. Higgins thrown out, but an RBI again for Matt Higgins makes it two nothing. Well, his outs have been productive. Hasn't been able to find himself on base, but put the ball in play, make the defense make plays. And as a result, he's got three RBIs in the last two games. And Matt Higgins with no hits and five in a row coming in, but two RBIs today, had one yesterday. Now Alex Steinbach, 0 for 1 today. He takes ball one. So you could say that this lineup composition for Josh Keim has really played out well. Leadoff man doing his job, getting on base, and then coming around to score, and the cleanup man doing his job, bringing in those runs. Durbin has scored two runs, Higgins has driven in both. One and one on Steinbach. Fly the center his first time. Sophomore committed to U of I, Illinois. Out of Parkland College this past season. Batted 343 with 10 home runs. Led the Parkland team in batting average, home runs, triples, slugging percentage, and total bases. Weak rounder toward Trinkle. And he puts it away. So Rockford strikes again. Matt Higgins scoring Caleb Durbin. What else is new? 2 nothing after 3. Nice crowd on the party porch tonight here in Rockford. A big game, attendance-wise, on a Wednesday evening, and why not head out to the ballpark with this weather? I mean, we showed up today. We did. We're happy uh, to be here. We show up every day, even if it's a 100 degrees or a beautiful 75. Kirk Liebert, Tom Jostin, and Corey Wright out to face Seth Tucker here in the Rockford fourth. Ebert walked and stole second in the second frame. Still looking for his first hit as a Rockford Rivet. Scored two runs yesterday, takes strike one. Liebert boasted a 636 on base percentage at Wabash Valley on the JUCO circuit earlier this spring. That's something, isn't it? On base well over half the time. 
and he's ahead 2-1. Instead of, you know, the set, you can fail 70% of the time and still be an all-time great player. Well, Liebert succeeded 63.6% .6 of the time. The dude doesn't fail a lot, but still looking for a base hit. It's that one foul the other way. Seth Tucker making his first start of the year. Hadn't gone past two innings in an outing. Here he is in his fourth inning of work. Doesn't seem to be having any trouble with the pitch count. Two, two on the way. We'll have another one. It is very odd when, you know, the Rivets only have a certain you know, set amount of jerseys in the same number, so the numbers get recycled, and you know, as new guys come in and guys come out. Liebert skies that one the other way, converging our three defenders, and there's a collision. Ooh. Whenever you get out near that bullpen mound, it gets scary. It looks like Trace Peterson is all right, help to his feet there. Rockford certainly sensitive to collisions as they lost Andrew Wilhite, who is most definitely one of their best players, especially as of late, to a concussion after that collision. And looks like things are all right between, I believe that was Catalano and Peterson colliding, but it was Sheck, Catalano, and Peterson converging right around that bullpen mound, which always makes things interesting. Everybody's all right, we'll resume. I'll have another 2-2. Two -two. And another. So all these guys taking each other's numbers, you know, number eight, Josh Dudden for all these games. Well, it's Caleb Durbin from Brendan Comey at number seven. And the list really goes on and on when you have only a finite number of you know, number of selections and jerseys. When These are two teams with you know, a revolving door of players, really. So many guys have come through these two programs. Another foul ball. So that's four foul balls in the at-bat consecutively for Lieber. Just staying alive. Rockford certainly wants to work up the pitching count on Tucker. As we were just discussing, he hasn't gone deep in many games. And that one stays fair and gets through the infield. Long battle ends in favor of Kirk Liebert. Rockford has the leadoff man aboard. Now, do you want to guess how many Rockford players have had at least one at bat this season? I'll go with 19. Way more than that. Okay, we'll go 25. We will go 32. Oh boy. 32 players have taken at least one at bat for Rockford this season. That includes Corey Wright. But not Corey Barbarian. So stepping in now is Tom Jostin. Pops up the first pitch. Colby Johnson calls off foul guard, and that's the first out of the inning. So here is the aforementioned Corey Wright. Struck out looking in the second in his first at bat for the Rivets this season. Had a number of them last season. But making his first start at first base tonight. First pitch to him. That one grounded to second. Trinkled a short for one. On to first, not in time. Wright busting it down the line. Breaks up the double play. So for pitchers, not including two position players, 
those being uh, Tim Lilly and Aaron Mann. Want to take a stab at how many guys have pitched at least one time for Rockford this season? Is it anywhere near the amount of hitters? Yes. Oh, goodness. Um, 30. 25. I should have gone with my first guess as Fumagalli waves and misses at the first offering. So without the overlap, that's 57 players who have come through the Rockford Rivets organization this season. 57. Everybody. Remarkable. Getting the shot in the Northwoods League here in Rockford. Nice sliding pitch. You scroll through these names and you're like, I remember when he played. A, a lot of these guys. How about we rattle some off? Yeah, I want to look at the opening day roster. Well, we'll give them to you. Joe Dittmar, closing games this week in the season. Colton Vermillion. Jay Hamill, Carter Lawler. Kyle Seabach, he was great. He was great. It, I was surprised when he left the roster. Braden Jensen. One, two to Fumagalli. He stays alive. There's been much less turnover for hitters, or for pitchers, rather. When you look at the hitters, then you really get the names. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were going over some pregame with our buddy Jordan Nelson. A lot of guys. Nolan Snyder. One of the nicest guys I've ever met. Tim Lilly, Jimmy Day, Kevin Cronin. And how about Corey Wright swiping second base? As that one got away from So Trace, but Wright was going with the pitch. And now Rockford's first baseman is in scoring position. Corey Wright wearing Nolan Snyder's old number. We have to look at the opening day. Uh, lineup for Rockford. That's when we really get an idea. Well, Corey Wright was the opening day starter for one thing. The lineup was like this. Blake Burroughs, Tom Joseph, Matt Higgins, Malik Williams cleaning up, Jeff Heinrich, Kevin Cronin, Aaron Mann, Jimmy Day, Michael Biederman behind the plate, and Tim Lilly. So Anthony Fumagalli draws a two-out walk. Rockford could have a Two out rally cooking with the top of the order. Up now, represented by Caleb Durbin. That's, that's quite the lineup. Carter Lawler took the loss in that opening game, went four and two thirds and allowed two innings, or two runs in those four and two thirds. And Nathan Schneiderman went three scoreless innings to end the game. Well, a game that was delayed by rain originally. Yep. First pitch to Durbin, just inside. Wow. So looking at the opening day lineup, see how many players are still active today. Tom Joseph, Matt Higgins, and that's it. Two players active. Well, Corey Wright would make it three. And looking at game two, Joseph still active, and Higgins, the same two guys. Both pitchers, though, as well. Burnett and Kime went the seven innings there. Well, lots of turnover, especially early in the season. 2-0 to Durbin. The patient approach is taking the first three pitches. That one for a strike. Should Durbin reach like he has his first two plate appearances? Johnny Butler waiting on deck. Someone skied to left. Be Josh Sheck the shortstop to end the inning. So Rockford strands two on base. We've still got a two nothing ball game in favor of the Rivets. Larry Larson alongside Corey Barbarian, thanks for joining us. In case you're just joining us, taking a look at the line score there. It's a close one, a pitcher's duel in stark contrast to yesterday's offensive battle. So you've got a pitcher with an ERA of 8.27 in Hunter Kime, and Seth Tucker, who has not started the game this season. And it's 2 nothing after four and a half innings. Kime throwing a one-hitter right now, and he might not even play the sixth. Yeah, Kime has only allowed one hit, but has 
five walks. So here's Johnny Butler to start the bottom half of the fifth. Butler, Vanderwall, Higgins. Part of the Rockford order. Rockford center fielder is one for two today. That one pops right out of Sotrace's glove. Still strike one. So the big question now is will we see Zach Jones in the sixth or will Hunter Kime come back out? That one popped up. So Trace calls for it and makes the basket catch. That one, not an easy catch to make. Three defenders converging, and it's the catcher to make the catch. And late adjustment, too, by Sotris. He overran where he had to go and transferred to a basket catch, and he hauls it in. So here's Vandy. Double back in the first, flew out to left, two men on in the third. Caleb Durbin has scored both runs for the Rivets, and Higgins has driven him in twice. He's on deck. One, one now. Rockford doing a nice job of maintaining that spray painted R on the mound. Now and again hit the other way for Vanderwall. And Peterson makes the play. Two quick outs. Traverse City up 5-0 on Kalamazoo. Rockford up 2-0 on Paddle Creek. So this is the result that Rockford wanted. And the fact that they were able to make it 9-8, Josh kind of told us before the game, the fact that Rockford with two big innings against them for Battle Creek was able to make it 9-8 with three in the bottom half of the, of the ninth was really impressive. And it, it shows the kind of hustle this team has, the grit that they have as a team. And they're putting it on display here today at Pitcher's Duel. And Rockford's come out with you know, grinding out a couple of the... Uh, of runs. Neither has come on a hit, a sack fly, and a ground out, both by this man. So Rockford going into a Kalamazoo series, it's going to be a, their biggest litmus test of the year. We say it every single time. Going to be crucial, and it's all about get them on, get them over, get them in, and Rockford has done that well tonight. So of the Traverse City, get them on, get them over, get them in. They might as well be their team name. They're outscoring Kalamazoo 11-0 in this series. It's just bonkers how productive they are. Their batting average is only a couple points higher than Rockford's in the bottom half of the Northwoods League. It really is bonkers. They will not waste any opportunities. They really won't. If you make an error in the field, that's a guaranteed run to score. Rockford saw it firsthand a few days ago in Traverse City. Both games tied at four in the eighth, and Rockford loses them both in the eighth inning. Higgins hits that one well to right field. If it's fair, it's gone, it's foul. Mm. Oh man, he really got a hold of that one. And a fan almost got hit out there. What the heck, she says, as she continues her walk back to the concourse. Matt Higgins all smiles coming back to the batter's box. That was a shot to right field. And Higgins, a guy who hasn't homered in quite a few days. Only one long ball of the season. It would be fitting if he does go deep, though. We'll see if he does. That one just misses the outside corner. So Higgins, 0 for his last 16, spanning the course of the entire road trip in this series. Nearly just pulled one for a monstrous home run. 1-2 on the way. Out ahead of that one. He's due, you could say. Swings the bat hard every time. Definitely a power hitter. He had 13 home runs season at Bellarmine. Team that's gonna move up to the D1 level. I'm sure, Higgins is excited for that. Looks like we're gonna have a mound visit from 
Mike Rubenthal. Will that be it for Seth Tucker? We'll see if he makes the call to the pen. They've got a left-hander up and pretty much ready. He has not made the call yet. We'll see if he takes the ball. Looks like just a chat. So it's Nick Klee, the left-hander up in the Bombers pen. What do you think the message is here? Well, how to approach Higgins here. It's mid at bat too. And I'm sure that Rupenthal has a pitch limit on Tucker. He's at 82 right now. And they're probably gonna, well, they're definitely stalling to get Klee ready, but he appears to be ready right now. He's not, not throwing. Yeah, it looked like the bullpen catcher was waving his mask towards the mound. Yeah, Gutierrez probably to, signaling. Probably to signal that Klee is indeed ready, but it'll be Tucker to finish this at bat against the dangerous but slumping Matt Higgins. Big swing and a miss. And Tucker sets down Rockford in order in the fifth. Score, Rockford two, Battle Creek nothing. <laughs> 